Well, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, hello, and thank you everyone for joining us today. My name is Katherine Hershey. I'm a member of the Illuminating Engineering Society, and I'm also the Vice President of the IES Raleigh Section. I would like to welcome you to our presentation on lighting design in the outdoors and minimization of environmental impacts. We have a great discussion lined up for you today, but before we get started, I would like to cover a few housekeeping items. At the bottom of your screen, you'll see a box for a Q&A. It's the chat box. Feel free to submit questions throughout the presentation. We'll address as many questions as time permits at the end of the presentation. Also, if you would like to receive a certificate for attending the presentation today, make sure you go to the chat box, download the two forms, and then send to the corresponding email on the form. Lastly, our presentations are all recorded and archived on our YouTube channel, which I have posted in our chat box. So you'll be able to view this presentation again or recommend it to others. And today we're happy to welcome Angela Saladino with Landscape Forms. Landscape Forms is the industry leader for over 50 years in integrated solutions of high design site furniture, advanced LED lighting, structure, and custom environments. Angela is the lighting regional sales representative in the Southeast for Landscape Forms. She has been in the lighting industry for 17 years in her role with Landscape Forms, she collaborates with clients, Landscape Form business development representatives, and lighting agencies to provide them with lighting and support services. Angela has worked for lighting manufacturers, distribution, and assisting with the implementation of utility rebate programs for small businesses. Prior to joining Landscape Forms, Angela worked for a lighting distributor where she was involved with all aspects of her projects from product selection and photometrics to assisting electricians and owners on site. Angela currently lives in Charlotte, North Carolina. She graduated from Appalachian State University with a degree in graphic arts. And fun facts about her when she's not working, she spends time with her two dogs mountain biking, and she's currently working towards becoming a certified animal aroma therapist. And furthermore, Angela, please take it away. Thank you. Um, I see a lot of familiar names on this call. So I just want to say hi to everybody. It's great to see you on here. Um, I am going to, okay, so everybody can still see my screen, I believe. Um, so again, thank you for being here for this presentation, uh, Lighting Design in the Outdoors and Minimization of Environmental Impact CEU. It is registered with the AIA and the LACES, um, and we will adhere to their best practices. Um, so jumping into our goals, I believe most of you are probably familiar with the, with the IES Lighting Library Standards Collection which is made up of lighting applications, lighting measurements, lighting science, and lighting practices. And the LPs um, bridge the material by translating science and engineering into best practices. And today we're going to be focusing on the curriculum um, from IES LP 220, so Lighting Practice 220, which is designing quality lighting for people in outdoor environments. And that centers on design elements um, of the outdoor space and the context and hierarchy of the lighting in the nighttime environment. And it really puts the pedestrian first. Um, we're all very familiar with the RPs out there that focus more on vehicles. So today we're gonna be focusing on the pedestrian in the outdoor space. And we also will be referencing Illuminance criteria charts from RP 4322. So um, jumping into objectives and just a quick side note, I have two dogs in my office and they should be quiet, but if you hear any noises, that would be them. Uh, so our objectives. First, understanding the context of pedestrian spaces and how that helps to determine a designer's approach to lighting those spaces. Understanding the hierarchy of design elements to consider when lighting outdoor spaces for people. Understanding what sky glow and light trespass are and how it, they impact mm -hmm. the environment being lit. Understand what light zones and land zones are and how they can be used in absence of lighting ordinances. 
and defining each of the lighting zones and the amount of light that should be used within each setting. So going into the first objective, lighting and defining pedestrian spaces. Um, so let's think about the visual experience within the outdoor space. Appropriate lighting design uh, for pedestrians at nighttime places a priority on how people see at night and the tasks that they need to perform without overlighting the space. So an example of this would be uh, designing lighting to navigate a space and avoid hazards as comparison to a lighting design for social interaction, inter interaction and enjoyment. And how do we achieve this without turning nighttime into daytime and not overlighting? So we really want to think beyond illuminance um, and think about how the human will interact with the contrast, the, the visual field, um, the fixture locations, the glare ratings, the color, not only the color temperature of the light fixtures, but also the color of the finishes within the space. So if we look at this image here, we can see that um, probably the main task at hand would be wayfinding and getting to this building in the background here. So the, this building is, is the focal point and there's a high amount of light within that building. So to balance that out, um, they went with um, what looked to be dark sky rated fixtures with specific distribution types to focus the lighting down on the pathway and provide um, balanced illuminance um, for people to have easy wayfinding and be confident on their way to the building. Um, so you really want to think about taking the comprehensive approach, which we will discuss more on the next slide. Um, so getting into the comprehensive approach and thinking beyond just illuminance. Um, so we have illuminance, reassurance, luminance, and visibility. Um, illuminance, which we're all familiar with, is the measurement of light upon the area of a surface. And how, something to keep in mind is that the eye sees luminance, um, which is light reflected from a surface. Um, and then we have reassurance, which is the action of removing somebody's doubts or fears within a space, and visibility, which is the quality or state of being perceivable by the eye. So how do all of these in overlap and interact? Let's think about a residential community um, within a um, wooded or, or mountain, mountain, mountain community up in the um, maybe Boone or Asheville. So if you think about the community's goals, they would probably be primarily focused on key, using the minimum um, suggested light levels for that lighting zone to help with protecting the font and the floor in the, in the area and really keeping that nighttime environment um, what, as it should be in the natural environment. So they would go with lower light levels or lower luminance, which would then impact um, visibility and reassurance. Um, however, those two items might not be as a higher priority for them as compared to an urban environment or an urban district where they would have elevated illuminance, vertical and horizontal. And it would be important to focus on the thoughtful management of luminance and the uh, reflectance values and the, the materials being used to establish a coherency of the surroundings, which would aid in visibility and reassurance um, within the space. So looking at this slide here, which shows an example of a more um, busy entertainment um, retail space, um, which we're getting into these um, more and more, and they're going to be involved more with outdoor spaces versus um, interior malls, which we're more familiar with. Um, and really thinking about, the, again, the pedestrians, uh, the task at hand, and um, not overlighting, definitely using uh, layers of light um, to um, address each um, application within the uh, vicinity. So looking at this image, they have gone with fairly low illuminance uh, balanced light levels on the ground for, the, for easy wayfinding. And then we have higher light levels within the retail windows for more eye catching. So as the pedestrians are walking by, they look into the retail windows. And then that's balanced out with some sparkle and decorative lighting with the string lights and the wall sconces. Another important part of the comprehensive approach is thinking about glare um, and how to prevent glare. Um, and the reason being the presence of glare in an outdoor pedestrian space erodes the visual interpretation of the environment 
and makes it uncomfortable for the pedestrian. So the goal is for the pedestrian to enjoy the space um, without having to consider where the light is coming from and potentially have to avoid the light source. So we have two main types of glare. We have discomfort glare, which is pretty much what it sounds like. It's uncomfortable and distracting, but it may not reduce visibility. And then we do have disability glare, which is a bright source close to the axis of view, um, of axis of view that is higher in luminance and uh, than, the, than the viewer's adaptation level, which causes um, an impairment to vision and visual acuity. So how do we um, reduce or avoid glare? Think about the size of the lighting equipment, the position, um, where the light source is gonna be in relation to the pedestrian, um, and the luminous intensity at each angle. So looking at the glare rating of the fixture, which can be found on the manufacturer's data sheet, um, mounting heights, um, and again, relating that to the angles uh, or the, the Viewer, where the pedestrians will be located and uh, viewing the light source. Um, and then the luminance, learning more about the materials and surfaces being used in the space to help with um, the light reflecting from shiny surfaces and potentially causing flare. And if we look at this image here, we can see that this light source on the left has um, no shielding and the light is just kind of being thrown all over the place and not where it needs to go versus the fixture on the right has a more focused and um, specific distribution aiming the light down on the ground where it needs to go. I feel like every lighting manufacturer has this slide in their presentation deck, so I didn't want to be left out. Um, but this is a slide showing an example of disability glare. Um, as you can see, or can't see this person in the background here. You can't tell if they're your neighbor or somebody coming to attack you. Um, and then this slide is showing um, where somebody just did a DIY glare shield by putting their hand up. Um, and now you can see that it is Milton from Office Space coming to get his stapler. So hopefully he's just gonna be friendly about that. Um, but some design techniques to use to reduce or eliminate glare. Like we talked about, we have shielding, uh, louver, baffle, um, diffusion of the light source, so screens, fabrics, filters, um, reflected light, edge lighting, indirect lighting, um, using less specular surfaces, maybe go to a mat or a textured material, um, and reducing the light output, which will tie into a great um, way for you to speak to your client about using controls and the benefits of lighting controls. So getting into light levels, um, so as we all know, the illuminance of a space affects the ability of a pedestrians to perform the visual tasks as we've been talking about. Um, and the appropriate light levels will encourage the reassurance and activity within a space. Um, and we need to both consider the horizontal um, illuminance levels and the vertical. So for example, with horizontal, we're thinking more about walking and pathways to detect uneven surfaces and trip hazards. And then with vertical, we think about um, safety and people being able to see people's faces and silhouettes and helping to determine the intentions of the people that are coming, that are in the environment, and also using it for def decorative aspects like um, lighting building facades. So a big part of that is your ambient lighting. Um, and lighting throughout an area that produces your general illumination, um, which will contrib contribute to both your vertical and horizontal illumination. Um, so it's also within the ambient lighting, that's not only within the space that you're designing, but you have to consider any ambient lighting coming from adjacent properties. And are those adjacent properties overlit? Um, and how are you gonna counterbalance that with the, your lighting design? because excessively bright luminaires can create glare, as we all know, and then more ambient light is needed to raise observer's adaptation level um, and compensate for loss of visibility. So it can be a slippery slope, but there are ways to achieve balanced light levels within your space. Again, using those low glare optics, proper distribution like we'll talk about. Um, and looking at this image here, um, this designer went with a pedestrian um, size pole light to help with the ambient levels and keeping those uh, at a decent, decently low um, 
light level, and that helped with um, having higher light levels on the stair treads to help with wayfinding and being able to see the depth of the stairs. Uh, well, in the background, they added in a little bit for decorative lighting of the planters and some sparkle in the church windows in the background there. So again, layering your light within a space. Uniformity and contrast. Um, we're familiar with these words when it comes to doing our photometric layouts. Um, and uniformity refers to the degree of illuminance variation across the lighted area. So the brightness and darkest, brightest and darkest points um, within a space. Um, the difference between the minimum and maximum illuminance levels and the di distance between those two um, can affect pedestrian reassurance and physical safety. So that's why we um, consider uniformity. And then contrast is an important factor in identification of an object. Um, so a, a successful design will provide sufficient contrast for spatial orientation and directional navigation without the introduction of glare. We are gonna <laughs> reference glare a lot in this presentation because it is nighttime lighting. Um, and we really want to um, avoid glare to hinder, hinder any visual comprehension. Um, and so examples of this, so we'd use um, low contrast for walkways and landscapes, and then potentially higher contrast for stair treads so people can see that there is a variation in the levels. I'm sorry about that, one of my dogs is whining. Um, so looking at a photometric calculation, again, I think everybody on this call is probably familiar with these, so you uh, can get an idea of um, your light levels, the uniformity, um, any spill light, any, any areas you have to change your distribution type to get the light more focused in certain areas. And this is all great, it's very informative, a lot of information, but um, you know, what do we use as a baseline and how do we know um, if this is a, you know, the right light levels, what, what do we use for reference? And that is where the illuminance tables within RP4322 come into play. Um, again, I think you guys are all familiar with these, but they have gotten, um, they have more detail now than they used to have, which is even better. Um, so uh, you can choose the application that you're working on. So in this case, it's pedestrian safety um, and walking surfaces. And then starting at the top here, fo they focus on lighting for human vision, visibility, and reassurance. Again, everything that we've been talking about. Um, they give suggestions on the horizontal illuminance, your uniformity. We don't have vertical luminance suggestions here because uh, it's for a walking surface. Um, and then over on the right-hand side, uh, these columns, we have lighting for responsible design. And that's gonna get into your glare ratings, your up light ratings, um, which we'll talk about those in more detail soon, and then your controls. And I always like to say that this is a great reference when you are speaking to a client or customer about utilizing lighting controls. And it's just a tool that you can have in your tool belt to help explain to them the benefit of controls, not only the longevity of the fixtures, but helping the environment and the people within the space. Um, another important uh, reference are the accept is the acceptable short length, short wavelength content, and this um, applies references the amount of blue content within a light source. So a couple examples here, we have VL, which would be for a light source that is less than or equal to 2000. We have L, which is a light source that is less than or equal to 2400K. And then we have M, which is less than or equal to 3000K. And for this to make more sense, we would reference our lighting zones, which we're gonna talk about more um, in a few slides also. Um, and that will help you tie it all together, is looking at your lighting zone and then just scrolling across here to the right to determine um, which would be a best, the best fit for the application. Um, color of light, again, very common terms we're probably all familiar with. We have the correlated color temperature, um, which describes the appearance of near white light on the absolute temperature scale uh, measured in Kelvin. So warm white, cool white, 2700K up to 5000K. Um, it is important to keep in mind that two 3000 Kelvin light sources could potentially have different um, spectral power distribution, and so they may look different. Um, so the spectral power distribution describes the variation across the visible spectrum 
spectrum of light output from a source. So what you could do here is ask the manufacturer. Um, so for example, if we're using two different fixtures from, but they're both 3000K, um, maybe ask each of the manufacturers for a spectral power distribution chart to see if maybe one light source is gonna have more green, um, the other one might have more red, um, and how off they will be if they're gonna be next to each other. Then we have CRI, which describes the average appearance um, of a small sample standard of colored surfaces when lit by a reference light source. And it goes up to 100, um, which indicates that the colors are identical. Um, so the color, how well a uh, light source renders the colors that it is lighting. However, that's a bit of an antiquated system. So um, TM30 has come out, which we're obviously not going to get into that right now because, as we all know, that's a presentation in itself. Um, but pretty much TM30 is a much more detailed um, approach, and it takes an objective and statistical approach to determining, determining how well light source will render colors. Um, so this next slide shows an example of a very low CRI. Um, and so as you can see, you can't even tell what color these cars are. Um, and we have a three foot candle average. The fixtures got retrofitted to LED. So you have a higher CRI of 82. You can tell what color the cars are. And we were able to lower the average foot candles because of the partly, partly because of the color rendering. Uh, we have a picture of an eyeball floating up here in the right-hand corner um, to touch on rods and cones. Um, so um, the rods in your eye are a bit more sensitive. They, they perk up at <laughs> nighttime, as you could say, um, and they are a bit more sensitive to whiter color temperatures. Um, this is something to keep in mind. And then your um, cones are more sensitive to, as a... Uh, more sensitive to the longer wavelengths, like, like your red um, light, light sources. Um, so going into the context of pedestrian spaces and thinking also now about the architecture and the um, flow of the space um, and how that can tie into um, what type of light source you're going to use, the color temperature, you know, how is the space going to be used from day to night? Are there any areas within the space that could potentially become really dark at night that have plenty of light during the day? Um, how will the color temp temperature, um, what kind of color temperature will be needed? In, in this picture here, they have brick and wood. So maybe you want to go more towards the warmer color temperatures. Um, and again, what will the people be doing within the space? Um, going into the hierarchy of design and lighting the pedestrian spaces. Um, so lighting design should uh, respect and relate to the principles and ideas um, and the intended hierarchical relationships within the, in, within the visual environment to assist with information giving value. Um, and kind of asking yourselves questions, which such as, you know, what elements are, are most relevant for estab establishing spatial comprehension and reinforcing the intended use of the space? How should the composition of objects and their surfaces be illuminated in order to portray intended hierarchical relationships? Um, so looking at this fixture here, the exterior hierarchy highlights the landscape entrance and the natural facade materials and provides a visual connection with the adjacent park and the bike trails. Um, Designing for outdoor pedestrian spaces. Um, so tying that in with the hierarchy and considerations of attracting pedestrians to the outdoor space. Again, asking key questions, which can be found in LP220. But this this kind of the, this version of the hierarchy thinks about the people and the community goals. What are their goals? Um, what lighting zones is this project going to be in? Um, what elements are the most important to light within the space? and just um, really getting everybody involved um, to have the most well thought out lighting design. This is also part of LP220, the um, hierarchy of design elements triangle, with the foundation being orientation and wayfinding, then going to reassurance, hazard safety, atmosphere, and enjoyment. So orientation and wayfinding, we're gonna start there since that is the foundation. Um, orientation is an essential function of lighting and the ability to understand one's place within this, 
one's surroundings um, and feeling comfortable within the space. Um, and achieving recognizable contrasts and patterns and predictable visual cues um, to help people orient themselves. Um, and then we have wayfinding and the ability to move and navigate in the environment easily. Um, detection of boundaries and identification of highlighting paths or means of egress will all contribute to a pedestrian sense of confidence and reassurance. So looking at this image, um, it's really easy to see um, when they have photoshopped out some of the lighting, how it can, you know, impact vision and, you know, you don't see your, um, the edge of the space where your exits might be. Um, and this, you can't use this object to help orientate yourself or figure out how far you, you may be away from it. Um, so all important areas to consider. And again, thinking about layering of lighting within the space. Um, also just showing that um, another illuminance chart to reference and this one will go into vertical illuminance because you're looking at building facades. So um, these are very detailed and it's extremely helpful when you can find your specific application. Going into reassurance, um, so lighting for reassurance is um, a combination of objective design, meeting codes, and subjective design which is meeting the needs of uh, a person not to feel doubtful or afraid. Um, so one part that is essential to um, provide people from feeling or with more information of possible threats is the vertical luminance like we've talked about in the past. So um, it can be difficult to have high enough light levels to vertically light people's faces, um, but studies have been done that found that silhouette lighting can also provide a lot of information to people to determine somebody's intentions as they're coming towards you and even, you know, their gender, all the details that you may want to know to help with being, being more reassured in the space. Um, and hazard and safety. So um, that gets into um, designing, uh, using lighting design to reveal terrains and curves and boundaries so you can safely navigate through the space. Um, and the example over here, we have um, lighting for the stairs and then we have lighting for a flat surface. So as you can see, the lighting on the flat surface is, is um, more balanced and even versus on the stairs, you have a little bit more variation to show the height difference in the stair treads. And it gives the pedestrian the, the um, option to choose which path would be best for them. Um, so this is another luminance chart just showing also they have it for atmosphere and enjoyment. So um, they do get very detailed in the applications. Um, so jumping into thoughtful lighting um, and the environment. Um, so we've probably all heard the term light pollution by now. It is a broad term that encompasses um, all the adverse and obtrusive effects from electric light. Um, although electric light has been important in the development of our society, we really need to start thinking about how it's impacting um, the fonta and flora that's surrounding us. Um, so let's talk more about light trespass and sky glow. Um, so sky glow is um, defined as a negative impact um, to the environment and it's artificial or human made sky light that contributes to um, stray light pointing upward, a combination of uplight, overlighting, increased short wavelength of, of spectrum. So that, again, going back to the content of blue light within a light source. Um, but then we have light trespass. Um, and that is a form of light pollution that is um, unwanted stray light from surrounding properties. Which, so it's pretty much what it sounds like. Um, I heard somebody say once that um, humans can close our blinds, but animals can't. Um, so it just kind of makes you really think about that and how it can impact the animals. We've probably also all heard about um, the turtles. Um, and somebody brought up something interesting the other day about how with the climate changes, they're starting to hear about the turtles migrating up the coast. Um, so we're going to have to think about turtle proper turtle lighting um, even in more areas than we have in the past. Um, so impacts of sky glow and light trespass, we have increased energy consumption, which ties into overlighting, um, disrupting the ecosystem and wildlife, which you just touched on, um, harming human health with 
pertains to circadian rhythm and having too much of that blue content in our light sources used for outdoor lighting, um, affecting crime and safety. Um, so that could apply where people tend to think that if they just throw a bunch of light it's in an area, it's going to deter people from um, do anything bad. I heard a story about a city that did that and the police never went to that area to patrol it because it was just had a bunch of light there and it turns out that the crime went up. Um, so it's again thinking about the comprehensive approach and everything that's going into the space. We also have um, the Bortle scale as a way to measure the impacts of sky glow and light trespass. And Johnny Bortle created the scale back in 2001 to help with amateur astronomers to compare the darkness of the skies they were observing. And it starts at one and goes up to about nine. Um, so it's really interesting scale to look at. I thought I had pretty clear, clear skies here in Charlotte. Um, come to find out I'm probably at a five. Um, and I've heard that in a one, you can actually see your shadow from the from how bright just the stars are. So I hope to check that out one of these days. Um, and then we have distribution types. Um, so why do we care about that? Again, that is in reference to putting light where it needs to go and um, avoiding light trespass. Um, so for example, if you are doing um, pathway or walkway lighting, Maybe you want to use more of the type one or type two instead of a type five and the light just spilling all over the place and going in areas where you don't need it. Um, then we have bug rating. So LP220 uses a glare part of the backlight uplight um, glare, glare bug rating system. And um, the glare rating is um, defines distribution of light emitted from a single luminaire within 10 defined zones, as you can see here. Um, for lighting equipment mounted above eye height, it is often the light found in the range of 60 to 90 degrees above NADAR that enters into the pedestrian's field of view against the darkness of the night. Um, here we just have a couple slides here showing a more detailed um, view of the backlight rating. Uh, then we have the uplight rating so you can see the angles that it's measured in and then how they come up with the uplight rating um, and then glare. So glare, they actually get pretty detailed and do look at the different distribution types of the fixture. Um, and then um, just touching on the bug rating and light pollution. So we're all probably have heard about dark sky. So that's putting all the light down below the fixture below 90 degrees. And this is a really interesting slide showing that um, how bad light pollution is getting um, and just really emphasizes, you know, again, focusing on your glare rating, focusing on your distribution, using lights with low blue content. Um, okay, getting into lighting and land use zones. Um, so we are probably all very familiar with um, land use zones. Um, zoning has been around for a while and it's a well-established practice in community planning. Um, so the fundamental idea behind zoning is that it allows the community to determine and regulate appropriate use of different areas within the jurisdiction. So how would this tie into lighting zones? Um, lighting zones, which would reflect the base or ambient light levels desired by our community, and it ties into the land use zones and setting limits on the type and amount of light that can be used within different areas. And this will make more sense in the next couple of slides. Um, so determining site specific light trespass levels. Um, if a lighting ordinance is not in place um, in the area that you're designing in, or if it's vague, um, you're, you'll still typically be able to find a land use zone um, reference. Uh, and it should have been assigned by the city or the town. Um, so then you could reference your lighting zone criteria and see how it ties in. So if it's a, a retail um, or a multifamily or um, a residential application, or if it's been zoned as such, then you could see which lighting zone would tie into that. And again, we're going to get into more detail on that right now. So talking about lighting zones. Um, so we have the LZ1. It goes up to LZ4. Um, but LZ1, you have no ambient light options here. It's um, think uh, wilderness parks and preserves, um, 
astronomical observatories, anywhere where um, protection of a dark environment is critical, um, you will not have any options for lighting. Then we have lighting zone one, which is low ambient lighting, and it applies to developed areas within a natural environment and areas of human activity that are inherently dark at night. So if you remember us talking about that mountain community, that would probably be an LZ1. So you're gonna have those lower light levels um, because you have minimal um, activity at night and they're really still focusing on trying to keep that outdoor space intact. Um, so think about these areas as single family, um, two family residential communities, potentially rural town centers, rural business parks, um, and other commercial industrial storage areas with limited, limited nighttime activity. Um, and like we talked about before, your um, illuminance criteria charts will have your lighting zones reference. So again, if you're working on a site or um, within a city that doesn't have any lighting or ordinances, but they, the land has been zoned in a particular way, you can come back here and, and kind of use your best judgment to pick which lighting zone that you could reference to um, figure out your, the best suggested light levels. And as you can see here, LZ0, there's nothing, no options, because they don't want you to put any lighting there. Um, then we have lighting zone two, um, which is moderate ambient lighting, and it applies to areas with more human activity, um, recreation and work, where electric light may be required for safety and convenience at night, so more, more movement going on at nighttime. Um, think multifamily, residential, institutional, schools, churches, hospitals, um, motels. And again, just showing you that you have your LZ2 reference here. And then lighting zone three, which are areas of activity where electric lighting uh, may be continuous and is required for safety and convenience at night. Um, so you're gonna use more uniform or continuous lighting in these applications. Think about areas with um, the commercial corridors, corridors, high intensity suburban commercial areas, town centers, mixed use areas. Um, then we have, uh, skip past that one, lighting zone four, which you can think of this as the no-no zone because nobody wants this much light. This is not um, something that a community would aim for. Um, typically, when a community is selecting um, the lighting zone, if they were to do that, to include it in a lighting ordinances, they will select based on what they're aiming towards, um, so in a more positive way to avoid light pollution. So um, we have lighting zone four is going to be areas with high levels of human activity at night um, and significant interaction among pedestrians and, and our vehicles. Um, so this is going to be like, you know, Las Vegas, um, New York City, those kind of areas. But again, nothing that we want to um, continue on or apply for um, a new, new environment that we are designing. And it is still is included um, in your illuminance criteria charts, but um, just that a necess necessity is a reference because they are existing, but again, not something that we would um, want to normally use. Yeah. <laughs> well, this was an excellent presentation. Thank you so much. That was very informative. Um, I specifically enjoyed when you talked about the spectral power distribution for the color of lights um, and talking about making sure that your manufacturers are, are within that you know, color graph and if the colors are going to match. Um, and even the bug rating uh, breakdown was super helpful for me. Um, I do want to remind everyone, if you do have a question um, at this time, you can add it to the chat box. I don't see any questions currently. Okay, well, if no one has any questions, Dan says, great presentation, Angela. Thank you. And Aparna said, hello. <laughs> hey, everybody. I hope to see everybody soon in Raleigh.